asking God to arise and scatter our enemies. And here's another promise from the scriptures that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Amen. You shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall. Let's declare it. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. That says the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. That says the The Lord has said so, and so it is. Amen. You may be seated. I'll just. One man gives freely, it gains even more. Another. Amen. Amen. It was just a verse from the tithing. <laughs> amen to that. To obey, to obey or not to obey. That is the question. Stealing a little bit from Shakespeare, it's a play on the words. Of course, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question. To obey or not to obey is not really a question, is it? I mean, yes, the answer is always obey the Lord. Amen? The scriptures have a lot to say about obedience and disobedience. Yeshua said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Which is to say, if you're not obedient, you don't belong to him. And I thought, wow, that, that's a pretty strong word. Is it, is it that strong when I was reading it? Is that really what it's saying? Well, then I bumped into Matthew 7, 21, which is even stronger. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Even stronger. So today, I want to look at a few different stages, if you will, or kinds of disobedience and obedience. There's a lot to go through, but let me pray and we'll, we'll, we'll begin. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the treasure in scripture, the examples that you have provided for us, God, to lead us into perfect obedience. I thank you, God, for leading this time right now and anointing this time in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Obedience is one of the first things we learn as children, isn't it? Just as a child can expect discipline and punishment for being disobedient to their parents, a child can also expect favor, warmth, blessing for being obedient. And it's the same between us and our Heavenly Father, isn't it? 
we too can expect discipline and punishment for being disobedient, but also great favor and blessing from God for being obedient. Why should we be obedient? Why is it important? Of course, because God (laughs) told us to, of course. But let's look at and understand the importance of obedience in general as, as a concept. Obedience is always important because those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much, and those who are unfaithful with little will be unfaithful with much. So obedience to superiors is always important. However, our obedience is increasingly critical depending on what is at stake. What's at stake? What happens if we disobey? That's important to understand. When a parent tells a child, don't chew with your mouth open, the result of disobedience there might be offending and annoying and grossing out dinner guests, for example. But when a commander says to a soldier, press the red button now, the result of his disobedience might be thousands of lives. There is different things at stake here. But kids, listen to your parents if they tell you not to chew with your mouth open. <laughs> However, oftentimes a soldier receiving an order isn't necessarily privy to all the information that the general has or, or the commander has. So he has to trust the commander. Whether people live or die is dependent on a soldier's willingness to listen, to trust, and obey. Even when the soldier doesn't understand. Parents understand that a razor is sharp, that a boiled kettle is hot, and playing with the electrical socket is dangerous. Whereas young children don't yet understand these things and they don't have the capacity to even comprehend it, they need to trust and obey their parents. I remember when Ariella was about one and a half, I told, do not touch the kettle, it's hot. But she loved to sit on the counter and watch us cook in the kitchen. She decided one day to put her finger on the top of the hole when the steam was coming out. She still remembers that day. (laughs) Trust and obey. So obedience is increasingly critical also when the one giving the orders is someone who has more knowledge or information and wisdom than the one receiving the order. This dynamic is present for an experienced coach and a young athlete, an executive who's privy to all the information, making company-wide decisions to the employees. But here's the point. If a parent is much more knowledgeable and wiser than the toddler and ought to be obeyed, how much more ought we listen and obey God? My goodness. Imagine the difference between the mind of a parent and the mind of a toddler. Now imagine the disparity between our minds and our understanding and God. I, I want to fall down at the even thought of that. That is even more ridiculous. It is unfathomable. It is infinite, immeasurable. On top of this, the obedience between a commander and his soldiers might have lives at stake, but obedience to God has people's eternity at stake. The stakes are even higher, and his knowledge that much greater. How much more? cause and reason for us to obey at every point. Amen? Actually, the entire mess that the, fa- the man, man has found ourselves in, the fall of man and all of creation, was really the result of one act of a disobedience, wasn't it? In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, God commanded Adam, saying, you may, we know the story well, you may surely eat Of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We know the story. Eve was deceived by Satan, took the fruit. And in verse 6, we find out she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So in verse 17, God spoke to Adam and said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. 
Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And it goes on. Now, lest we have some, us husbands have funny ideas about this verse, let's clear up something here. <laughs> in other words, because you have listened to your wife instead of me, instead of me, the easiest place for us to miss it is with the ones we love, those who are closest to us. Husbands, wives, family, friends are a great blessing, but we need to make sure that they do not usurp God and therefore rendering them an idol in your life. The simple definition of an idol is anything that you love more than God. Simply put. And we are called to love God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. But if someone in our lives has the ability to be prioritized over God, that needs to be corrected immediately. That is urgent, urgent need of repentance and return our hearts home to God. Of course, it's not only people, but anything can become an idol when something in your life begins to be prioritized. When God took us out of Egypt and gave us the Ten Commandments, the very first commandment, what was it given to us? Exodus 20, verse 6, you shall have no other gods before me. Or you shall have no other gods besides me. Because how can we be obedient and useful if we're first serving someone or something else? We can't. And I, I wanted to share, during COVID, I bought some kettlebells, and I started working out with them. Some people might laugh, they always bring up kettlebells. <laughs> so I have a keychain of a kettlebell. I got into kettlebells, okay? Let's put it that way. And I started to really enjoy it. It was fun to use them. It required no discipline for me to have my kettlebells work out because it was fun. I had to fight to not have my workout that day, okay? It got to that point, okay? It got, it got, it got serious. Then all of a sudden, my diet's in, in, impacted. The protein shakes, you know, how much protein did I get today? One, you know, gram per body. But anyway, that whole thing, you know? And eventually, I was like, wait, today, you know, I'm going to fast. I feel like I should fast today. Well, you know, but I had a really good workout. You know what? I'll fast tomorrow. I'll get my workout in today. And all of a sudden, things started to be arranged around my workout routines. And I was very uncomfortable inside. And I knew this was not going to stay this way. Something good and healthy, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your workout, absolutely. But once it starts to become the center where I'm prioritizing other things around that priority, that's when it became an idol. And that's when it needed to shift and change. So needless to say, something needed to change, something as healthy and good, as innocent as physical training, but yet that is something that an enemy, the enemy can use to build and distract you, build an idol in your life and distract you from God. Now I wanted to pause to give everyone an opportunity as we continue to think on that thing. Is there something in your life that is coming up now that you feel like you've been spending a lot of time energy and focus that has been pulling and almost trying to monopolize. And if there is, then you have an opportunity now to correct that, course correct now. And do not wait, do not hesitate, because whenever one looks back, whenever I look back, at the, it's just wasted time. That's all it is. It's just wasted time distracted from what is most important. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So at first, you and I might disobey and realize there's an idol, see what's going on with the kettlebells like I did, and hopefully at that moment, there's a repentance and a willingness to change, and we change course. But I want to take a look at another level of a degree, if you will, of disobedience or a kind of disobedience. The next stage from there is actually to, to notice it, 
but then to disagree with God. That's another level where you, you disagree. No, I want this. No, I want that. That's what I want. There's a disagreement there. And I want to look at that. Instead of changing, there's a stubbornness that comes in. Perhaps it's out of sheer frustration. I understand this. I understand this. This may be akin to throwing a tantrum. This is like a spiritual tantrum, throwing a tantrum. But I don't want to do that. And I don't mean to demean it in any sense because I've been there, but I pray no one is there today. And if you are, again, we have opportunity today to make that course correction. But this is a stubbornness of our will. And to examine that, I want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. The elders of Israel gathered together to Samuel, the prophet, the priest, the judge, the great man of God, Israel at the time, they, they gathered to him, all the elders, and they demand from him, we know this part, he, they demanded a human king to rule over them. They wanted to be like the other nations and have someone rule over them. But this displeased Samuel and God because they weren't supposed to be like the other nations. God himself was to be their king, to rule over them and protect them as he did in Egypt. Samuel went on to warn all the people of the terrible things that will happen if they have human kings to rule over them. Samuel tried to persuade them, but their hearts were made up. They disagreed. They disagreed. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 18, or, or verses, sorry, 19 and 20. Samuel tried to persuade them, and then this is the response. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also will be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So this is the disagreement. They heard from the Lord, but they disagreed. And the danger of being stubborn and stiff-necked, what's even worse than that is actually then getting your will instead of God's will. That's, that's a problem. Let's turn then, let's continue in the same chapter, in the next verse, in verse 21. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. How doomed to failure is this plan now? We, we talked about earlier, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things. He's the creator of all. But yet, here is an example where the people have stubbornly disagreed and told Samuel, God told Samuel, obey their voice. They've made up their minds. They're, they're being stiff-necked. Hindsight is 2020, and so I'd like us to, to take a peek at how truly foolish this was and what Israel really did that day. Let's look very quickly at what God told Moses when he called him. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. This, when I read this, it really struck me. Exodus 3, verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. What did God say? He will come down. I will come down and deliver. And I love, we always hear that in, on Passover. I love that part. I will come down. God himself came down. And what did he do? With great power, signs and wonders, himself led Israel out of slavery, destroyed the Egyptian army through the wilderness, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, manna from heaven, water from a rock. God is doing it all, preserving and protecting his people. He was their king. He was the commander. He was their God. And when Israel found themselves under the hand of the Philistines during the time of Samuel, they asked for a human king. But God was saying, no, I will be your deliverer. I'm to be your king. And look at this. So God came to Moses and said, surely I've seen your affliction. 
I've heard their cry, I know their sufferings, and I have come down. Well, let's take a look now at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 16. Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. That struck me because God, again, he, he has seen his people, heard their cry, but instead of saying, I will come down and deliver them, the people didn't want that. So what did God say? I'm sending a man from the, from the land of Benjamin. That was their choice. That was the ultimatum. What are you gonna, how are you going to have it? Are you going to have God come down? I believe he was willing to be their king, to come back just as he did in Egypt and deliver them himself. But the people said, no, we want to be like the other nations. We want to be like them. Give us a man. And so what did he do? Obey their voice. Give them. And how did that turn out? Our stubbornness, what is the point? It keeps God at a distance. We're not willing to obey. There's a distance that we're, we're pushing away, saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. And that always results in striving, in a just a terrible way of living. The weight of everything is in the strength of your hands. And you will feel at that, th those times how weak we truly are when we're without God. Without God, we can do nothing. We need more and more of God, less and less of ourselves. If we are to be stubborn and persistent, it ought to be in prayer. And, and, and a will just to say, I'm going to hear from God. I'm going to persist until I hear from him. What is your will, Father? So one more stage I want to look at. There is yet another stage. So disobedience, when it doesn't immediately result in a repentance and a change, it can become a disagreement or a stubbornness. But if stubbornness persists, it goes beyond stubbornness to flat-out refusal. It becomes refusal. And this kind of disobedience leads to deception, pride, and sin. And we'll turn this around. We're going to get to obedience. Bear with me. Bear with me. But I want to take one more example in the life of Saul here in the, in the book of 1 Samuel. Saul was the first king of Israel, the one that Samuel first anointed to be king and Israel's deliverer from the Philistines. And he started off very well. He led Israel to great military victories. He outlawed witchcraft in Israel, worked closely with Samuel in the beginning anyway, and it started off well. Saul often consulted God for direction when God didn't reply. Saul understood it was due to sin, and I want to look at an example of that. When Saul and his army were succeeding against the Philistines, he wanted to continue to pursue them all day until none of them were left. But before he went ahead and did that, he consulted God. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 37 and 38. So Saul asked God, Shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. So Saul therefore said, Come here, all of you who are leaders of the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. Saul became a very disobedient king, jealous, prideful, not careful to obey the Lord and Samuel. Told He was working with him, but yet he was stubbornly disobedient. And, and Samuel told him that God has found someone else, better than he, who would seek after God's own heart. Let's take a look at 1 Samuel 28, verses 5 and 9. So he knew to consult God. He knew to ask. He knew that sin was the reason he wasn't hearing from God. But now when we look at 1 Samuel 28, verses 5 to 9, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. So here again, King Saul is not getting answers from the Lord. Saul understood, as we saw earlier, that when God didn't speak, 
There was sin we needed to deal with, undealt with sin. But here, the sin was in himself. But what did Saul choose to do this time? Did he repent? Did he change his ways? Let's read in verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. King, King Saul had outlawed divination earlier, and now he himself, we read later, he has disguised himself and himself has gone to the medium to, to hear from the Lord. That's where this took him. What was Saul expecting to hear? Was he so blinded at that point that he expected good news? What would happen? And here is, as we turn to the corner into obedience here. What would have happened if King Saul sincerely repented? I think the same thing would have happened that happened to King David when he repented for gross sin in his life. He's, God is not a respecter of people. When David, he numbered the people knowing it was sin, he yielded to lust and stole a man's wife, had the husband murdered, and yet in all this, God established David's throne forever. He is regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest king of Israel. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart, ready to repent. When he was confronted with sin, David's heart broke, and he repented and changed his way. We don't need to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But if we will yield, if we will surrender and obey God and refuse to disobey, if we say, I will not disobey, only blessing, only blessing comes. King David is a great example of this. God is rich in grace, rich in mercy. I want to take a look at an example of obedience now. How much does God love obedience from his children? And what is the result of obedience? Let's take a look at what I think would be the second greatest obedience in all of Scripture. Let's turn to Genesis 22, verses 1 to 3. We know the story very well, but there's a particular spot here I want to focus on. Now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham... And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So let's catch this. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. This always astounds me. How soon after the command to sacrifice his son, his only son, did Abraham set off to obey? The next morning. Is that not incredible? How many days or months might we delay a command like that? How long would it take us? Let me pray about this. That must not have been God. Let me, let me, let me fast and pray on this one. How much of a procrastination of obedience might happen? Abraham woke up the next day and went off to obey the Lord. At something of that stature, my goodness. And God didn't stop him on the way. Okay, you left. Bless you. The fact that you're even willing to go and get to that place, bless you. No, it was when Isaac was already bound and the knife is in the air. God says, hold on a minute. That is incredible. That's the obedience of Abraham, the first patriarch, the father of faith, the friend of God he is referred to. So let's read. What is the result of this obedience? What is the result? Genesis 22, verses 16 to 18. This is God speaking to Abraham. By myself I have sworn, which there's no better way for God to say a promise to you. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? 
because you have obeyed my voice. What did God do? He returns the gesture by coming down himself by giving his son, his only son, except this time he went all the way. Yeshua went all the way. He laid his own life down. Yeshua knew and understood what was coming, and he was in deep distress until sweat like drops of blood beaded and came out of him. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, and this is the greatest obedience, of course, and going a little farther, Yeshua, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, look at this heart. May our hearts emulate this. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Obeying God is often not easy. In fact, it is often hard. Sometimes it feels like dying to ourselves, doesn't it? Because that's often what it is. But God gives us the victory. Philippians chapter 2, and we're just wrapped. We can call the worship team up. Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. What was the result? We know what the result of Abraham's obedience was and the blessing that came from there. What is the result of this? In, cha- in verse 8, Philippians 2, 8, and being found in human form, Yeshua, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Yeshua Messiah is Lord. Amen. Can you give me a little little tinkle in the background? A little soundtrack. Romans 5.19, for just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, like through Adam and Eve, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. And I want to end on this verse, and I want to speak this verse to all of us here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. This is... What about now our obedience? What is the result of our obedience? Well, I has not seen, ear not heard, nor have entered. Actually, let's read this together if we have it up. Can we read this together? And we'll finish on this. But as it is written, things no eye has seen and no ear has heard that have not entered the heart of mankind, these things God has prepared for those who love him. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for you and for me if we will love and we will obey him. Amen. Though we are maybe small, though we are weak and feeble in and of ourselves, through an obedient heart like David, God can do anything as long as we are willing. Amen. So let's stand now. God, I thank you, Lord, that every single one here, God, I thank you for surrendered and obedient hearts here, that each and every one of us here today and now would set our hearts to obey and to serve you, Lord. I thank you, God, that we would be after your own heart, that our great delight would be in bringing your heart great delight. I thank you, God, for that kind of focus. And I thank you, Lord, that the, the ble- we're not doing it for blessing. We're not doing it for all of that, Lord. We are doing it because we love you. And though it sometimes can be hard, though it may be hard, God, I thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In Yeshua, you have conquered the world. In you, we have peace. So I just thank you that if there's anyone here that is struggling in their hearts to obey, I thank you, God, that you would pour out grace on them right now, God, that each one of us would say yes in the name of Yeshua. And just to prepare the ministry team, Joe and Jane, Michael and Darlene, Natalia and Dima, 
If you can make your way up, we'll, we'll have some prayer. Thank you. Behold the Lamb of God who has borne the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us, Redeemer and Lord, Son of God, our Messiah. Say it. Say Elohim, Yeshua, Yeshua, we bow down and worship Behold the Lamb of God who has borne the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us, redeem. So I just don't want to invite you to come up. Don't hesitate. We have some time for prayer. We will get, you know, to the rest of the service and the Oneg after, but we will spend some time here. So please don't hesitate. Come on up.